Hi. Hello. Hello. What a nice backdrop. Yeah, I'm at a, <laughs> I'm at a hotel in Greece. Your hotel? Uh, well, mine and my sister's. Yeah. Yes. It's a mess right now, but it's like the camera sort of vaguely upwards towards a painting. You can't, you can't see the mess. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, I actually, you put that beautiful picture of the island on Twitter. So I, and we're looking for a holiday destination. So I started looking. It's impossible because I think, you know, it would be too many flights, etc. But it looks amazing. And, where, yeah. where would you be coming from? Leeds in Northern England. Mm -hmm. So I think the eco work that you're doing might be undone by all the effort it would take, <laughs> yeah, all the flights we would take. So another time when we're in the area, maybe. Yeah. But I went to, uh, so to to try it myself to take the train from from the UK to see how how that works. Yes, yeah, so I, I might do that mm. this year. <laughs> We've got two teenage boys. I, th I want it to be a bit quite easy. It's the last year we'll be going away as a four because my elder son's 18 now. Um, yeah, so probably he won't come away with us from next year. Mm. We'll <laughs> see. So thank you so much for agreeing to do this, especially at a really difficult time. No, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. So, I mean, if it, I, I told you it's for, for someone from Eastern Europe. It's, it's just mm. I'm not. I don't have family left in in Romania. I never had any family in Ukraine, but it it, it sort of brings back memories. And and it's something mm. we, we thought we were done with that we'd never have to worry about Russia again. I have a Romanian student. Actually, I must send her a quick email and tell her remind her to come. Um, she. Uh, yeah, so she was saying she had much similar feelings to you that it's bringing back bad memories. What age were you when you left Romania? 11. Right, uh -huh. yeah. But you st you s speak Romanian and yeah, yeah. you're quite, yeah, yeah. Is, it, is that your mother tongue? My mum is Romanian, my father's from Yemen. And what language did you speak at home, both? Uh, no, I don't, I... Well, I lived very briefly in Yemen, but I, I forgot Arabic after, as I grew up. So Romanian, and now my family, my mum emigrated to Sweden. So now my, <laughs> my family's in Sweden now. <laughs> so you speak Swedish and English and any other languages? German, because in Transylvania where I grew up, there was a German community and um, I went to a German, German language school. Oh, that's amazing. Every time I come on the Zoom, I'm like pa Pavlov's dogs because um, I'm learning Hindi. So mm -hmm. I'm spending a lot of time on Zoom. Like, since the pandemic, I'm just obsessed. I'm doing at least two hours a day of Hindi and a lot of it's Muslim it? people. What's that? Who is it? Is, it's a different alphabet as well, right? It is. It is. It's Devanagari. It's beautiful, but it's quite hard. It took me about three or four months just to be able to get to the point where I could make out the simplest words. I just was repeating the letters for months and then, but it's actually once you crack the code, it's all right. It's very phonetic. So I'm really enjoying that. It's been one of the few good things about COVID. Do, do you see any similarities between it and European languages? It's, it's an Indo-European language. So there's surprisingly many similarities yeah. like dance for teeth. I mean, that's clearly a European root. What else? I mean, a lot of words have made their way into English, like jungle is originally a Hindi word meaning forest. Mm -hmm. We use it to mean a like tropical forest, but they just use it, use it to mean any. So they would describe, you know, English wood as a jungle. <laughs> um, and, and lots and lots of English words because of colonialism are there in Hindi as well. So if in doubt, you can just say the English word and it'll probably be understood <laughs> as long as you put it in the right place in the sentence. It's the grammar that's really hard. Grammar, and obviously getting used to Devanagari, those are the two hard things, because it's like German, there's, the verb is at the end of the clause or the sentence. So there's a, for English ears, you have to wait a long time for the action. But it's beautiful. I'm really enjoying it. And I made lots of friends around the world. I remember you wrote, you wrote a, an article about the book in a Pakistani daily. That's right. Yeah, so this is all, um, I wanted to learn Urdu for Pakistan, because that's where my research is 
is based, but um, Urdu is a really hard language to learn because there's no infrastructure, whereas the Indians have got themselves organized and they're on Duolingo, there's loads of apps, there's lots of easy, Rosetta Stone as well, there's lots of infrastructure and since the two languages are very similar spoken it's it's like Geordie to, to mainstream English say but they can't re read at all reading's completely different mm -hmm. but it, it should be better for when I go to Pakistan diff completely different but um, Urdu is more similar to Arabic and Persian is a sort of hybrid alphabet yeah mm -hmm. Yeah. So in terms of what we do when people start to arrive um, in 10 minutes, um, I've got a very short introduction just about you. But if you want, I could also talk more about talk about the novel as well, or I could leave that up to you, whatever you think. And then obviously you're going to present your piece about hope. And then you and I can, I've got questions about climate change, about the novel, about, I'll also try to respond to what you've just been saying about hope as well, try to adjust my questions so they fit mm -hmm. with your talk. And then I don't know how long you want to do this for. I, I realise that the advertisers have put six till seven. They didn't ask me. I, I In my head, it was like six till 7.30. So what, should we just see how? I'm okay with whatever you think is, I'm, yeah. I'm free. It's eight, eight o'clock in Greece. So it's not, okay. <laughs> I don't have anything else. Yeah, yeah, great. Well, we'll just, I'll tell the audience it'll be an hour to an hour and a half and we'll just play it by ear. If it's okay. running out of steam, we'll end at seven UK time. But if it's really lively, we'll just keep going, I sure. think. And if you want to, eat a banana. if you want to speak a bit about the novel, maybe that's good. It will give people something. To... Yeah, give them a flavor. Mm. I realized in my Dawn newspaper piece, I never talked about the Talos stuff, the AI is so interesting. I think for the sake of ease, I cut that out or I didn't. So I feel a bit guilty about that. And I could mention that side of the novel or um, it's a little hazy in my memory. I mean, I can just sort of- Everyone tends give... to prefer one or, one or the other. Yeah, I had lots of yeah. feedback saying, oh, I love that, but it was lukewarm about that. And like, <laughs> the same. <laughs> I liked I liked both sides, but um, I think it was just hard to in a short time, you know. And they I had a word limit for the newspaper, so I just it was concentrated a really, really on. Good review. I had it. I discovered it because friends sent it to me and said it's a very good review. <laughs> oh, thank you. Well, I just you know I'm a fan. I'm a big fan. That's why I would love to come and stay in your hotel one day. And um, I just I think oh, the climate activism is great as well. Mm. Here's Amy. She's um, a visiting scholar from China at York. Mm -hmm. Hi, Amy. You're early. Mm. Do you have any questions or any anything you'd like to flag up before we start? Uh, no, not really. Mm -hmm. You can hear me okay? Yes, perfectly well. And what's the painting? It's really beautiful. It's an, uh, actually, actually it's an underwater photography. It's, mm. a, it's a photo, but taken underwater, sort of made to look like a Baroque painting. It's beautiful. So these are your students who will be joining? Amy is a colleague from China. Sonia is, yes, a student. A lot of them will be PhDs or master's students. I think some undergraduates, well, you know, just I've sent it to a lot of people. So let's see how many. I imagine we might get, we won't have such a huge audience just because there's a lot going on, but I hope for, for at least 15 or so. And of course, if it's okay, um, I'll edit this recording because it's been recording since the beginning because I didn't know how to not, but I'll cut it off our chit chat. Um, would it be okay to put that online? Sure, sure, yes. sure. And that means I could also share it with people who weren't able to come. Mm -hmm. Is it uh, literature or is it creative writing or something something else? Um, so we do offer creative writing now at York, which is quite a new thing, but most students are just doing straightforward criticism, literature, 
but the hope project is interdisciplinary so the guy who started the hope thing is from politics Indrajit Roy and he um he's like interested in like hope from below so he wants he's sort of writing a book about audacious hope it's called like about a resistant kind of hope rather than the sort of reckless optimism that Boris Johnson has and then another colleague called Sanjoy Bhattacharya is doing a sort of health and hope strand about the pandemic especially and I'm hoping the imagination from literature they're really good colleagues yeah and I can't wait to hear what you thought of the theme of hope it should be interesting and what we'll do when your piece is ready no no big hurry but when it's ready what we can do is promote it as like, if you missed the talk, here's, we'll put it on our blog and people can, you know, that will generate a sort of second wave of interest, hopefully. And I mean, maybe we'll, I mean, in my head, I, if we get enough pieces and they're good enough, I might start looking for publishing options as well to take them off the blog and start thinking about making them a bit, you know, polishing them. And it, it might not be possible. It's just a thought that I have. Mm -hmm. That would be nice. But obviously, I'll, I'll check with you first. Mm -hmm. So it sounds really good and, and this view is really good. If you want to get, get water or anything or a cup of tea before we start your Yeah. And what's the temperature there at the moment? Uh, today was a, was, a, was a holiday. It's called Clean Monday. I think it's the beginning of Lent. So it's a day when Greeks eat seafood and fly kites. I don't know exactly the connection. An but interesting was, combination. But it was nice enough for us to be out on a beach, like with with, right. a, with a little picnic, and then we flew kites. Wonderful. The winter here is strange because it's it's the time when the island is green, whereas in summer. It, you know, everything is dry. So it's mm. exactly the opposite from at least Northern Europe or Central Europe. Yeah. So it's actually quite a nice time of the year, I guess. It's very nice. It doesn't nice. sound too cold, yeah. Can you hear dance music in the background? Because my son, my teenage son has chosen. Can you hear it? Oh dear. No, you can't. I don't mind. Okay. You don't mind? Well, I do. I think I might tell him to. He wait, always does. Wait, 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 wait. It's gone. No, no, okay. it's just a. Are you sure? No, because he's. it's just between songs, I think. <laughs> I've got right. a bad feeling. I was hearing I could. No, talk. nor can I. Yeah, and I think. It's just he's finding the next track. I've got a horrible feeling. He always starts with an unerring sense of when I'm busy. <laughs> Let's see. It might be fine. I'll just check Twitter in case anyone's struggling to get the, because a few people said that they had to register and they did it too late, but no, it's fine. Emails fine. My Romanian student is coming as well, so that's great.
Oh, this is the noise. I'm just going to speak to my son about this horrible noise. <laughs> Hello? Yeah, we had words. Great. Am I, if there's questions or something, during the talk am i supposed to notice it or will you alert me that someone no i'll we'll what we'll do um and i'll explain this when everyone comes as well but yeah i'll collect them okay. and i'll read them to you or people can unmute themselves but you don't you just concentrate on your talk okay. and completely completely ignore the chat yeah Diana is who? So, yeah, there's something wrong with the, I think the address on the um, event, right? Possibly. Um, so a few people. I think it's split the link. Possibly. Thank you for letting us know, Patricia. One of my students is struggling to get in. I'll post it on Twitter as well. Oh, Diana's there. Hi, I was just telling Oana about you, Diana, because you you share the Romanian heritage. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Oana. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Where are you where in Romania are you from? Oradea. Okay, cool. I'm Sigishwara. Oh, nice. Oh, even better. <laughs> So I'm sorry if people had struggles to get into Zoom. Nothing is in my inbox um, or on Twitter, so I'm assuming it's not too bad. But this might be intricate. This might be something for us to think about for next time, because I think the Eventbrite sort of broke the link into. So that was so people had to sort of paste it back together again. Intricate. Yeah. This is Oana Absolutely. as well, who's leading the project. Yeah. Good to meet you. Thanks, Claire. Thanks, Oana. To meet you. Claire. So welcome everybody. It's really nice to have a lot of people. This is more than I was expecting, and it's great. And I know that there's a lot going on. It's the end of a long term, beset by strikes, etc. So I'm really grateful for the support. And I know that you're going to have a very interesting talk. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, a bit of housekeeping before we begin. Um, so the way the the event is going to work is I will introduce Oana and her novel um, for a few minutes, just um, I don't want to hog the limelight. And then I'm going to hand over to Oana, who's written a short piece about what hope means to her. Um, and then, or, you know, whether we can be hopeful at this time. And then, um, then we'll go into an in-conversation, the two of us. I've got some prepared questions, which I'll probably also adapt um, to respond to her talk. Um, so we'll have a, a, a conversation. And then 
I'll leave at least 10, 15 minutes for your questions, which you can either put your camera on and unmute yourself and ask directly to Oana, or you're very welcome if you if you prefer not to do that or your connection isn't strong enough, you can just type them in the chat. You can do that all throughout the talk, but Oana won't be looking at that. And I probably won't be looking at it very much, but then at the end, if I can start collecting them and, you know, you know, it'd be really good to have a lively discussion. It was advertised this event for six till seven. We may go a little bit longer than that. Um, we'll just see how it goes. We might finish at seven, depending on the amount of, um, you know, questions that, that develop. So without further ado, I, I don't need to let anyone in so I can concentrate on what I'm talking about. Um, I will start just in one second, hold on a minute. Um, and it's really just a great pleasure to have Oana here. Her novel is, is amazing. And I we didn't know each other before this, um, but I reviewed her novel for Dawn, which I write a regular newspaper column for about literature. And I just really was, because I'm very interested in pandemic novels at the moment. So I was really struck by what she was doing in this novel. Um, Under the Blue, which was published, was it this year or it was the end of last year, August? It, it, it was March last year. March last year, okay, time flies. Um, so it's been out a year now, um, but it really is, um, well, I'll tell you more about it when I've found my documents. Give me two seconds. Okay, with roots in Greece, Romania, Yemen, and Sweden, Oana Aristide lives part of the year in London, or she used to, I think now you're fully on the Greek island of Syros, where with her sister, she runs an eco-friendly hotel. And I was just saying before others arrived that um, I was checking out the hotel. I was even tempted to, to come on holiday there. It looks absolutely incredible, um, but I think it would probably would undo the amazing environmental work she's doing for me to get multiple flights. It's not easy from Leeds where I live, um, but still this is her, her project at the moment. But she's also obviously an amazing writer. And Under the Blue was her debut novel, which as, as she just said, came out in March, 2021, but she'd started writing it in 2017. And many of the book's vignettes have eerie counterparts in events from the last 21 months. Indeed, in Under the Blues afterward, entitled A Plague of Coincidences, Oana Riley describes herself as a kind of slow poke Nostradamus, producing prophecies that are too late out of the gate. And honestly, reading the opening sort of sequence of Under the Blue, it's about uh, this, this guy is quite a hermit. He's an artist and he's holed up in his flat painting his um, dead nephew as a project. He wants to do this portrait for the nephew that, um, that died. We suspect he's a bit of an alcoholic as well. And he's, he's in his own world and not, he's having a complete news blackout. And so he starts to see, he starts to notice people on the streets. Um, his neighbor comes in in tears. People's behavior is, is strange. And some people are even wearing gas masks. And you become aware that something horrible is going on. And it turns out that it's a pandemic very similar to the one we've been through, except more lethal with a, a lung disease that is universally fatal. And there's a strand that I was saying to Owen, I felt guilty because in my review, for the sake of the word limit and just my own ease factor, I didn't talk about a whole section of the novel or you know, intervals in the novel which deal with an AI computer named Talos and these scientists who are a kind of, well, I don't wanna do spoilers, but um, there's a whole kind of strand about artificial intelligence and responsibility and scientists' um, motives and relationships which is really interesting, but I, I concentrated more on Harry, this protagonist who only realizes quite late in the day that there's a huge pandemic going on. And he flees to his, um, he's got a property in Devon in the countryside. So he has this hellish journey to get there. And the girl that he's seen rushing into her flat, very upset about the pandemic, who he's had a crush on, much younger woman named Ash, um, turns up at his, Devon place with her sister Jessie. Jessie's a climate activist and he, Harry takes an immediate dislike to her because he fancies the sister and he feels that Jessie is kind of getting in the way and also her politics are too much for him 
and the three of them kind of go on a, a road trip to try and escape from the devastation that's going on. That's a really short summary, but um, it really is a fascinating novel. Lots to say about gender, about, um, about public health, um, in the internet, technology, um, and also about race and colonialism because they're fleeing to Africa. And these are the kind of things that I'd like us to talk about perhaps in the Q&A. But um, obviously this series of talks, it, this is the first one of my um, Hope in the Imagination strand from Indrajit broader an amazing project which is about hope and we're together with Sanjay Bhattacharya from history together we're a, um, a consortium for hope and so um, this is the first of the Hope in the Imagination series and we have asked Oana to think about the whole issue of hope and she's going to just present some of her thoughts um, and then we'll go into our Q&A so thank you very much Oana we're so pleased you could be here. Thank you very much, Claire. Uh, and thank you also for the review. As I said, it was really, I, I found out about it because friends emailed it to me and told me, look, someone got your novel. <laughs> so that, that was very, was very nice to read. Um, yeah, so when, when you invited me to speak about hope, I started thinking about how I felt when I was writing the book and if anything has changed since then. Uh, and for, there's one aspect of this that I, I already mentioned in the afterward of the novel, that I, I do feel that it's a different world now, not just for the worst, because I mean, we had a pandemic <laughs> that was caused by environmental mismanagement to a large extent. Um, but when I started writing the novel, it felt like a bit of a you know, sort of lone wolf thing, that it was a niche topic. When I was, when I was speaking about it, about climate change with friends and about us being responsible for it. P people were resistant. There was, and I, I feel, and I felt this already when the book was published last year, that this has changed, that there's now, there's a majority of people who are not only concerned about climate change, but admit that it has something to do with our actions, our you know our decisions as consumers as voters uh, and this is a good change this means that we, we can start not, not only have we started thinking about how we can how we can make a difference but we're influencing politics we're influencing companies so i think that's for the better and also i mean when i started writing there was we didn't know of greta we didn't know of extinction rebellion and these are two two huge movements. Whatever you think about them, I think it's it's good that they exist. Um, the the growth of green parties in almost every European country, uh, you know, now they are forced to be reckoned with, and I think even even parties that don't have you know the label of being green, climate change is one of the main uh, electoral issues. And this is this is only set to grow. So in so in that sense, we're much more aware now, and as as a society. Uh, the other thing that makes me hopeful is technological progress. But but this is a bit. We should not count on it. We um, the re the reason I'm. I, I find this topic controversial is that when people mention technological technological progress, it's often presented as an alternative to us uh, mitigating climate change by, um, you know, altering our consumption or reducing our consumption and so on. And that's not how it should be. We should not count on it. We should do those things anyway. And then if we're lucky, it's not like we don't need help. If we're lucky, then technological progress with, will help us along the way. I mean, People have spoken, have spoken about fusion for, I think it's 70 years since they started trying to achieve fusion and achieve energy at a, at a, you know, to take out more energy of the process than you put into the process. Uh, and there's been some progress in the last few years where researchers seem to be saying that, you know, we're much closer to it than we think, but, and this of course would be, it's the best thing that could happen. It would immediately eliminate our reliance on fossil fuels. 
but it's not very likely to happen. So it's more like a, I think of it as our get out of jail card. <laughs> if, if all else fails, then we might benefit from this, but it shouldn't, it shouldn't be a substitute to, to other actions. Um, another topic again, that is sounded a bit like wishful thinking a few years ago, but now is actually properly underway is legal uh, changes that would make the environment and non-human beings to give them the same legal <clears throat> the same legal protection or similar legal protection to what we have and to what our property has. Um, the, the main point here is that whenever we've had societal change, it happened, the law is a bit behind the front runners, but then it's much, much ahead of the majority. So if you think of slavery, when, when the anti-slavery movement started, it started from a few people and it was far from, it was far from the majority and then it got actually banned. But at the point when, when it was banned, it wasn't that all of society was against it, but the legal change made it yeah, illegal and unthinkable and eventually uh, all of society accepted that this is how it's supposed to be. I think a really, a really good example in this sense is one of the last countries to give women the vote, if not the last, was Switzerland. And it's <laughs> it was in the 1970s. And it's because um, it happened by referendum. So it wasn't that you know, the parliament was convinced or the government was convinced. They had actually to convince, convince everyone. Uh, so that's why I think if we can get a just a significant enough mass of people who will in parliament or in um, in a position where they can vote for this sort of change that would immediately make an enormous difference to how we how we treat the environment um, and this is <laughs> I shouldn't have mentioned this but What's happening now in Ukraine and Russia, I don't, I mean, it, it sounds horrible to say that there's some sort of positive side effect of it, but it does seem to be galvanizing public opinion and political will in the direction of a sort of Manhattan project for, for clean energy, um, which is long overdue, but yeah. <laughs> Um, I don't know how much, uh, if, if you're at all interested in virtual reality and in what's happening now with um, you know, the, the investments that Facebook is making and Apple. And it seems to be in tech circles that it, this is the next big thing and they really, they're really betting on it becoming almost our interaction of choice, like it will replace social media. And I was wondering, when I first heard about it, it sounds completely unappealing to me. I, I, I really don't, as a consumer, I don't see the point of it. And I was wondering why so many people who, I, you know, I have similar opinions to them in other respects, why they seem okay with this. And it, the only reason I can think of is that it would mean a shift of resource, of real resource consumption to virtual reality. If, if we fulfill those needs that simply have to do with you know, mindless consumers in a virtual world, it means we don't have an impact on this world. Uh, so in that sense, it would be something positive. Uh, there's still issues, but for instance, we know that uh, Computer hardware has a lot of uh, metals and chemicals that are still, it's, the extraction is not environmentally friendly and there are also issues with child labor and exploitation and so on. So it's, 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 not, a, it's not clean in, in that sense, but it, it might be an improvement. Um, and the last reason I, I see for feeling, feeling optimistic is 
that fiction is finally dealing with, with climate change. Um, and it's important because I think fiction has an advantage on nonfiction, which can sometimes feel like you, you know, like homework, like you're being taught a lesson, whereas fiction can sort of smuggle a point of view past you and you don't, not a point of view, a lesson past you and you don't even realize that you've been told something that isn't, it's not entertainment, it's, it's a lesson. Um, and that's something that fiction can do easier than, uh, than nonfiction, especially when that lesson is controversial, you have some sort of inbuilt resistance to it. I know when I, my sister was, she became conscious of climate change before me. And I remember our talks and that I felt, I felt sort of personally attacked and my, I had a knee jerk reaction of being defensive, of refusing the idea that it, it might be my fault in some way or that I can do something about it. And I think it's very easy to, to, to get into this situation when you're, you're simply telling people what to do. Whereas with fiction, you can, you can put them in a situation in the future or in the, in the shoes of someone else and show them a different world without triggering this defensive uh, reaction. Um, and yes, yeah, so these were like the six reasons I, I see for feeling some optimism now about climate change. The last point I would like to make is that a thing that I think has to, we have to realize is that it, it carries costs. It see, to me, it feels like societies, even when they, once they acknowledge that th we have this problem, that they refuse to admit that there's costs. Everyone, was, everyone wants to have a, a transition to a, a, a you know, cle to clean energy without, without simply accepting that it will be more expensive. We will have to reduce our consumption. And there's no, there's no way. I'm, I'm, I'm reminded in this when communist countries came out of, uh, after 1989, after the revolution, when they all came out of communism, and it, all the, and all the Romanians were like, yay, now we can live like in Germany. And it was, no, you've just stopped digging the hole, but you're still in a hole. It will be difficult to get out. And I think vis-a-vis -vis climate change, this is where we are now. Now we have to stop digging the hole and make our way out. And it, it will be difficult. And I, I think it would be preferable for politicians not to lie to us that we can do it cheaply, that it will, it will cost. And the sooner we accept it, the better. That was great, Anna. Oh, thank you so much. It's like reasons to be cheerful and, and you've given us seven really clear ideas and they also fit quite well with the sort of questions I want to ask you. So I'm going to start where you ended with um, climate change. And I wanted to quote from Amitav Ghosh's book about climate change, The Great Derangement, because I think what he just what he says there really chimes with what you were just saying. The quote is, what we've learned from this experiment is that the patterns of life that moder modernity engenders can only be practiced by a small minority of the world's population. Asia's historical experience demonstrates that our planet will not allow these patterns of living to be adopted by every human being. Every family in the world cannot have two cars, a washing machine and a refrigerator, not because of technic technical or economic limitations, but because humanity would have asphyxiate in the process Asia proves it so he's being ironic because he's not really you know he's not really calling for a kind of two-tier system but he's saying that when Asia started to um to have the ability to have these things that was when things start to go wrong and it, it kind of shows the hypocrisy of this desire in the west you know for you know materialism so I just wondered if you could talk a bit more, because you've got so much to say in the novel about climate change, about this, you know, just a bit more about what you were saying at the end there about we'll all have to, you know, accept higher prices and reduction. Yeah. This is so embedded in how we, consumption is so embedded in how we think and in the way, in everything, in the way we evaluate business success, in the way, like the foundations of our economics that it's 
it requires a change, not just at the level of how we think about what we need in terms of stuff, but it requires an actual change of how the economic system works. Uh, it's all built up on, it's based on endless resources and eter you know, eternal growth and everything else is considered bad, even if, I mean, even if that growth is negative, like, you know, you can, there are many controversial issues about the way we count, we, what we consider as economic growth, like, you know, the prison population expanding, that's positive growth when, well, really, is it? Uh, and the same with pollution and all the externalities on, on the environment and on our health and so on. So, it, yeah, we simply need to have a very, very serious discussion about it. And it, it requires politicians to be very brave and honest and not kick the can further <laughs> you know, into the long grass. It's just some, someone in a, in a position of power has to have the courage to risk losing an election and simply say, you know, say it like it is, that we have to reconsider the way everything, trade, uh, pensions, everything. There's no, there's no easy way out. How do you think the pandemic might change things? Because we've seen such huge uh, changes and demands being made of us and your novel has a lot to say again about pandemics. And at the top of the, your talk, you said that the pandemic was largely caused by climate change mismanagement. So I wonder if you could talk a bit about sort of zoonotic diseases, about the future of, of disease as well as the climate emergency. Uh, yeah, when the novel came out, everyone was saying, oh, how could, you know, you predicted this because you know, it was very, it was similar to the, the virus was similar to the virus in in real life but the thing is it was a very very likely thing to happen it, it was in a there were good odds <laughs> for this happening unfortunately uh, and yeah the causes can be i mean we don't know what's going to happen with a permafrost melting this is the scenario in the book where permafrost melts and it's uh, frozen carcasses are re releasing bacteria or viruses that we have no immunity to. Um, and with the, uh, with the coronavirus, we think it came from consumption of, um, of wildlife in Asia. I, I, I don't really think that this, with the numbers, with 8 billion people, I don't really think this threat can be eliminated. Um, Obviously, there should be protocols in place for dealing with it better. I, I thought the reaction, our reaction to the pandemic was terrible. It could have, it could have been stopped at the beginning, but for some reason, there was, either there was no plan or no one, I don't know what happened, but I thought our, the reaction of the world was pathetic. There was no cooperation until it was far too late. Um, but I think more, more or less, I believe that it will happen again. I don't think this is a this is a threat that we can eliminate, even if we're very careful. We're simply too many, and unless we restrict people's movements and to a degree that I don't think we want, I don't think we can avoid going through this again. And I wanted to ask you as well, relatedly, about the novel's representations of characters' relationships with the non-human. So there's lots of kind of interesting um, vignettes about that in Under the Blue. For example, Harry has to bury a cow in a really disgusting scene. And then um, Ash later on has this turn away from meat and, and really can't bear to, suddenly can't bear to eat meat anymore. Um, and there's lots of other animals that feature like cats, fleas, and a dog. Um, outside the animal world is the bitter lake that nearly kills Jessie with, with its pollution. 
Um, so yeah, I just wanted to ask you really about, you know, about how you allowed the non-human to figure in the novel, because often novels are so focused on the human, but you seem to be trying to extend the, the canvas. Yes, uh, I was also trying to I was trying to make a point about any our interaction with nature and the threats that uh, come from nature that they're not they're not necessarily obvious and they don't they're not necessarily aggressive in the way we think of aggression or that. nature doesn't require us to respond to it in a sort of action movie way. It's usually more subtle and it requires more thinking about it and you know, longer term action. Um, so that's why I, the lake was a consequence of something that, you know, a terrible business decision to, uh, to put up extremely polluting factory. Uh, by a lake and not to handle uh, the, the alcohol properly. Uh, the dead cow was, again, I wanted it to be something extremely passive that is still a threat and that the main character doesn't properly know how to deal with it. Actually, <laughs> a friend of mine who's a farmer read it, read that, read the book and said about that scene that it's like, a farmer would not do that. <laughs> there are better ways of dealing with a dead cow. <laughs> um, but we, don't, we all lack, most of us lack this knowledge. We would be, we would fail in very, very simple situations. It doesn't, you know, we wouldn't be uh, hunted by packs of wolves. We would probably die from poisoned water or from failing to deal with a dead animal properly or things like that. We, we, you're no longer really good at dealing with nature. Yeah, and there's another moment where Harry thinks he's caught the virus because he gets food poisoning from a can of fish that's gone out past its sell by date. So you're kind of, there's a lot of kind of subtle um, points about how we're so used to everything just being prepackaged and there for us, that the, the inability to cope. And the other thing um, is the nuclear threat because the characters are trying to flee to Africa because as everybody's dead, pretty much, um, the nuclear plants are going to go off because there's no one, no one overseeing them anymore. So um, it's, I guess there's there's a lot of very dystopian tropes here. Um, you know, you've got the you've got climate change and um, the pandemic threat, so and also the kind of nuclear threat and a artificial intelligence, the the robots turning on their masters. So I've got you know sort of that's a question in two halves. The uh, the nuclear um, side of things, you might have side, something to say about that, but also just more broadly whether you see yourself as in the novel as fitting into the dystopian or post apocalyptic genres. If, sorry, if the novel is a uh... yeah. If it's a post-apocalyptic or a dystopian novel, if you feel comfortable with those labels, or, or yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the nu the nuclear aspect is a so first of all, I couldn't get a straight answer out of anyone of if this is really what would happen. Um, Twenty years ago, I think it would have been. For, for sure, the scenario in the book would have been the plausible scenario now. The, there seems to be so many fail safes having to do with nuclear reactors that there are a lot of experts who are saying that the, re, the, the nuclear reaction would be stopped. The, you could cool the engine. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be the sort of disaster that is, is predicted in the book. So, and the, the reason I, I, I'm a bit, <laughs> maybe I feel a bit guilty about that is that you, there is a, you can make the point that nuclear will help us manage the transition to, you know, to renewables. And I, I don't want to, I simply don't know enough about it to say that 
it's the right choice at this moment to turn them off. There are, there are a lot of people who are very, very uh, environmentally conscious who argue that you no, know, we should keep our nuclear reactors and help and allow nuclear energy to help us uh, manage the transition. But as a as an idea for the book, I thought it was this idea that we booby trap the planet, that even if we all disappear, it's we still we're still left with this massive problem. And I was really interested in how Africa figures into this because um, the reason the three of them leave um, Britain for mainland Europe is that they, they want to go to Africa, um, you know, to flee this nuclear threat because with the long history of underdevelopment, Africa as a continent hardly has any atomic energy. So it might just be the only safe place on the globe. And more than that, their conservationist mother had been working in Central Africa before Armageddon hit. And there's an outside chance she might still be alive. So, you know, this whole trope of Africa as, as a promised continent for them, um, although we never see them actually reach Africa. But I wonder if there was a sort of, if you were pushing against colonial, ideas with that strand of the novel. Um, I, I No, not necessarily with that, but I, there was a strand of novel that I eventually got, didn't leave in the book about uh, the two sisters being immune to the disease because of being, like, you know, very, mixed race uh, and through some fluke, you know, genetic fluke. Uh, so that was the only aspect I had about uh, the only idea that had something to do with colonialism and, you know, white Europeans and uh, other peoples. I, I didn't have a, there, there wasn't anything in my mind about colonialism. It was, it was literally this, that there, I think there are some nuclear reactors in South Africa, but other than that, I don't think there are any in, in Africa. There's also much less need for energy. Mm -hmm. And most of our energy goes to the for heating and... Yeah. For me, it felt like quite a hopeful moment in the novel that um, despite all the, all the kind of, all the centuries of underdevelopment um, and, and colonial history that now, Africa was having the last laugh because it wasn't yeah, going to be destroyed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But really, it was just a practical decision based on your research. Yeah, mm -hmm. interesting. Um, what else? So, oh yeah. So, just coming back to dystopia and post-apocalyptic narratives, um, I wondered if you were. I wondered if you had any other archetypes in mind any influences I wondered if it might be a writing back to Cormac McCarthy's The Road whether consciously or unconsciously because some of the tropes are similar like the forest fire and obviously the road but yours seemed a much less individualistic approach and um, also more feminist and less about meat and the nuclear family than Cormac McCarthy so that was just my thoughts but um, yeah I wondered if you had any forebears in your mind at certain points during the writing process? The, the whole book, I wanted to write about, uh, want to write, write climate fiction and I, the starting point for me for the book was this, was the road trip and this, this atmosphere of it being too late. Um, and I wanted the main characters to reflect on how they got there. Uh, and, and also reflect on their on. I want to have these two dimensions of their personal history and regrets and the sort of all of humanity and regrets. Um, so the, I, I didn't really, I don't think I was inspired by the road, but you know, you never know these things <laughs> subconsciously maybe, but I, uh, there's a novel on the beach, uh, ne Neville Shoot. Uh, I think it's from the 1950s or 60s, an Australian writer uh, that has this, this sort of atmosphere that I was aiming for, where we just 
went completely wrong. In that book, it's uh, we think it's nuclear war. Um, and again, it's a, it's a small group of people for whom it is too late and they have to, they have to deal with it in a non-hysterical way. <laughs> uh, yeah, now that, that was the main inspiration for me. That's really helpful. So um, coming back to your talk about hope, you, um, you know, you pinpointed technology as, as something that, that has optimism, but we should be careful because of it um, sometimes being seen as an alternative um, that allows us not to change anything about the way we're going, around, going about our lives. Um, and so I wonder if you could speak a bit about the novel and about the artificial intelligence element, the Talos and these, it's all sort of set in the Antarctic. Arctic or Antarctic, I forget, but it's sort of polar. And um, again, it's about people who survive the pandemic because they're in such a remote place, but there's also this computer talos. So I wonder if you could sort of tell the audience a bit more about that strand of the book and how it might fit with your thinking about technology that you have outlined in the talk. So that strand of the novel is, it's two researchers, a man and a woman who are, teaching an AI, uh, well, they're teaching it the history of the world and they're asking it, so they're feeding it his, the history of the world in chunks. And after each chunk, they're asking the AI to make predictions about what, hap what will happen next. And so they're training it to predict what will happen to humanity. And the idea is that eventually it will be, we reach the present day and it will be able to guess, predict, threats to humanity and then we can avert them. This is the, gen the general framework. Um, what, what I want to do, to do with that is, uh, I think we, again, yeah, we, we put a lot of faith in technology and particularly in AI, we have this idea that artificial intelligence would be like a very clever human. Um, and implicitly the assumption is that we are very intelligent, we just, you know, cannot compute as fast, or we're not, uh, we simply cannot store that much information. And that's not what artificial intelligence is at all, because we have, you know, we have feelings, we have biases, we are very much not artificial intelligence. <laughs> uh, just look around. <laughs> uh, so I want, to, I want to make that point that so if we would achieve our goal of creating artificial intelligence, it would, I don't believe it would do what we want it to do. I don't believe it would be, you know, the, the robot villain that we have in, in fiction. I don't think Talos is a villain in that sense. He doesn't go off, you know, wanting to take over the planet. Um, but yes, I, I, I meant that strand as a, as a criticism of this idea that we really know what we're doing and we just need more of the same. And my last question for now anyway, until, um, and we'll open up shortly for your questions and if they're slow in coming, I've got more that I could ask. But anyway, so my last question for now is, about hope and creativity, because that's one of our three concerns on the Hope Project. Um, so it's so art features quite a bit in your novel, and you also mentioned it as one of the seven glimmers of hope in in the talk. Um, and I mentioned that Harry, the the male protagonist, is an artist, a painter, and is is doing this portrait of his nephew Tim for atonement of their relationship when he was alive. Um, and there's, you know, lots of debates about art, sometimes from the naive perspective of that computer Talos, Talos trying to find out what art is for. Is it just entertainment? Does it, does it make us better in some way than animals like dogs? There's lots of these kind of questions are, are dramatized. So um, I just wondered, yeah, uh, if you could say a bit more about that whole issue, which you did mention about art as, a, as and, and the fact that novelists are starting to think about climate change as one of your reasons to be cheerful.
even those of us who deny that art somehow makes us special i think deep down we believe it we because we cannot really put our finger on what art is we can define most things but it's very very difficult to, to define art or to even to say what it's for it, anything about it we could all agree that it exists and then there's there's no more agreement so i wanted it i i just i thought it was a a relevant subject in the context of what humans are and how we should position ourselves ourselves relative to the to the rest of the living world um, and it me i meant it also as a counterbalance to the very rational points that talos makes about what we're like and the, basically the criticism of humanity i meant harry to be the sort of you know, difficult to explain not at all rational but that there's something there that uh, i don't want to say redeems but <laughs> i know it, i i imagined in the book i imagine it as something a, a defense lawyer would say if humanity was <laughs> on trial yes that's great so uh, open the floor for your questions so please you welcome to unmute yourself and ask or to pop your questions in the chat which i'll read out to Owana, whatever you want to do if they're slow in coming i can have a follow-up question about art but um yeah, I'm sure that your questions are more interesting. Amy, is that a question? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Oana, and thank you, Claire, for this uh, very interesting and also very highly relevant conversation. It's extremely relevant. Uh, I must uh, tell Oana, uh, do I pronounce uh, her name correctly, Claire? Yes, Oana? Oana, oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, you. You do not know how popular you are in Chinese book market. Your name is everywhere in our website, and uh, and uh, the ad the advertisements just to say you have uh, predicted uh, cleverly uh, the coming uh, pandemic, and uh, actually the coming out of your book uh, uh, verifies Aristotle's statement again. That is. Uh, poetry, of course, literature, sometimes tells more truth than history. And uh, I have two questions, maybe they are uh, closely connected with each other. Uh, yeah, uh, everybody uh, have already realized the, the uh, emergency of reducing energy consumption. Uh, but um, when we call for reducing energy consumption, how to make sure justice because developing country, de developing world will say, uh, we are just beginning to try to obtain uh, those conditions, those uh, enjoyment that ho have already been uh, obtained by the developed world for okay, many decades. And uh, so this is a very complex, uh, complicated question. Of course, everybody wants to reduce that, but uh, still some people will feel this is very delicate to, to sort out. This is the first question. And the second question is closely connected with it. I'm thinking uh, here you raised the two characters, one uh, main characters uh, uh, among others, one Harry on the one side and Talos on the other. May we say they each represent this binary opposition. One represent uh, because Harry is an artist and he represents maybe humanity and Talos um, is an AI, so it represents science. And especially in the pause um, of the year, uh, <laughs> discussing and maybe say challenging and retorting with each other. This is also the clash. Actually, we found the clashes uh, appearing in the whole world that is the clashes between humanity on the one side and uh, uh, scientific development on the other side and uh, what do you think where hope exists on which side thank you very much thank you uh the first question you're, yes, yeah you, you're absolutely right there's a huge question of fairness here 
and I think the way to solve it is the same, the same way we would have solved solved it even if we were only talking about the West, about a let's say about a uniform level of consumption, is by this is this is not uh, uh, inevitable. Th this state of the world and this our penchant for materialism and consumption is not you know innate. It's not a given. It's a choice we made. Yeah. We went down that road. So it's not it's not something that we absolutely need or we we instead of telling people yeah you know i know we you all want it but you can't have it we should discuss the fact that we went down the wrong road that this is not the thing and it there's no evidence that it makes us happier there should be an honest discussion about us simply having made the wrong choices not just in terms of consumerism destroys the environment but that it's is just not something worth pursuing in general. Uh, and I, th I think if, if the West comes to believe it, and it's not, it's not a dishonest claim, it's, I, I don't know, I, I, cannot, I cannot think of anything that you know, makes me more miserable than spending a day in the mall. It, it's, it does not, it generally doesn't make pe people happy. So I think we should simply admit that we have to try, we have to find other ways that make, make us happy. Um, and the second question, I did, I'm not sure I, I understood. You said there was an opposition between science and... Uh, Humanity. Uh, I, I'm talking about actually the two subjects and the two uh, way of thinking. In the sense of which... Uh, which as represented by Harry on the one side and the Talos on the other side. One, like one art artist, and science? Do you mean art and science? Yeah. Uh, yeah, art and the science. And where's the hope? Uh, 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 oh, wait, yes. Which one, re which one represents hope? Yeah. Uh, well, in the book, science has no, you know, there's no, uh, there's almost no stakes for it. Uh, Talos is just curious and nothing else. And if anything keeps him going, it's the desire to find out what happens. Uh, so hope is definitely on the side of, it's us who, who need hope. Okay. Um, I don't know if that uh, answers your question. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other questions from the audience? Please pop them in the chat. I'm sorry, David, that there was a problem with the, the link and we'll try and sort that out for the next talk, but luckily there's quite a lot of it here. Um, yeah, anybody else got a question for Oana? Adrian. Yes, yeah, so I, was, I was gonna pick up on this point about, um, I'm not, I, haven't, I, I, I haven't read the book, I might, I might know the answers to this, but, um, a couple of things on, on the climate change aspect, because you mentioned artificial intelligence and, and virtual reality. And one thing that strikes me about that is, sure, that's going to lead to a massive demand for energy to drive all these machines, <laughs> which again is, is going to be a, a, a vicious circle, perhaps. It won't necessarily take away, or at least not eliminate altogether, that, that, that sort of climate destroying um, consumption of, of, of resources. Um, I don't think regular uh, computer use is that energy intensive. I don't know if you're thinking of cryptocurrency, but that's it's a completely different process. For example, yeah. No, yeah, but that is a unique process, and it it's not replicated in the way we normally use a computer. So, for instance, using a computer cons consumes much much less energy than taking a trip to, a, you know, by taking the car to a shop or something. It's not. Unless, of course, it's used for crypto mining. Hopefully, it will be that. But that's what I'm thinking about the, 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 the side of the metaverse, which is going to require a huge amount more, I think, um, computing power to run it. Who knows what the outcome of that will be? No, I think even a, a, 
computing power, if you accept um, crypto mining, is a tiny percentage of our energy use. So mm -hmm. I think if that, if some of the other uses would shift towards virtual reality, I, I don't think that that would increase uh, energy use at all. I think it would decrease it. The, the problem would be in the metals and chemicals that are needed for, for the hardware and that are in themselves, like often the mining is damaging to the environment. Good. And, and the other thing I was going to mention was um, the, the fear I suppose that I have that, that climate change continues, that and you mentioned Africa, for example, there's a huge problem, isn't there, about uh, habitability, <laughs> you know? Um, well, it will continue for sure. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It, and it, it try out, it can become overheated, then what happens? Yes, and areas in, in, in parts of the world that, you know, for instance, were fertile and were good for uh, growing crops, that, that's no longer the case. Uh, this will, I mean, even if we do everything we can now, this will continue for some decades. We won't, we won't turn it around immediately, unfortunately. We've got a very interesting question in the chat from a creative writer, Halima Aledi. Halima, if you want to show your face, you're welcome, or I can just read your question out for you. Um, Halima is a PhD student at University of York, and she asks, I'm interested in how Oana grappled with a hefty dose of environmental themes and climate change in her novel while ensuring the aesthetic quality and emotional intensity of fiction. Here's Halima. So she's doing a creative and critical um, writing PhD at, at York at the moment and um, yeah on themes of refugees and Palestinians and it's really really great stuff and she's grappling with some of these ideas in her own work about how to balance the political with the aesthetic. Thank you for the question. Uh, well I'm, I'm not the one to judge if I managed to balance it or not. Uh, I, tr I, I knew the topic was uh, difficult so that's why maybe I, the novel is more of a thriller than what I would normally write. Um, the, <laughs> something that happened is I had a lot of readers sort of reacting to the novel thinking that, ah, you needed a plot so you, you thought of climate change, but actually it was the other way around. I wanted to write about climate change and I needed a plot. <laughs> Uh, so the plots serve the, the purpose of what I wanted to say. Um, I think if you, if you start from the, the characters, um, I don't know, I, I, I really shouldn't be the one to answer this. It, 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 my readers should, should say whether this works, whether they don't feel lectured to or... Um. <laughs> Definitely don't feel lectured to. But um, have you got any tips or tricks? Were there any things that were really, any moments where you felt you were being too didactic and then you fixed it or any advice you got from so outsiders the, that helped? Yes, so if, if we're thinking about the talos, the dialogues, the, if, if you just, if you read a description of what they are, it sounds incredibly didactic. <laughs> uh, and the way I, I try to make them easy to read and so you don't think about, uh, about that, that aspect is that I the, the dialogues are a, are a learning process and essentially the AI growing up and it, it jumps very quickly from one uh, age to another so there's very there's very quick movement in in the um, in the evolution of the of the AI and also in the dialogue, so you don't really have time to sit and sort of, uh, you know, what is he saying that he's moved on to the next thing and you're surprised hopefully by what happened or how he evolved. Uh, so this I, I I try to keep to make it pacey in the way the, the AI learns. To compensate for the fact that it, it's all it's a lot of history there's a lot of uh, this philosophy ethics great does that answer your question helena yeah thank you so much that answers my question yeah i'm, I'm always interested in how you know you can bring these topics into fiction without 
as you said, you know, like kind of taking into consideration that people read fiction for the aesthetic experience um, and they don't want to be lectured to. And I do agree with you at the first, you know, part of your talk when you said that, you know, fiction does offer this thing that nonfiction cannot, which, you know, sometimes you, you learn a lot of things without being, having that, you know, uh, you know, being lectured to, as you said. Yeah. Thank you so much. You, you learn to feel mainly from fiction. It provokes an emotional reaction. Have we got any other questions? I am conscious it's seven o'clock, so if there aren't any, we're happily can end it there. But if you have some burning uh, issue that you'd like or wanted to talk about, then please uh, unmute yourself or pop it in the chat. I'll give it one more minute in case somebody's frantically typing away. But um, yeah, no, I'm really glad you came back to the, the point from the talk about what fiction can do that other forms like especially sort of history and politics books can't necessarily do that that kind of what you said smuggle smuggle in these ideas and and then just now talking about it, teaching us to feel that's really really valuable for us to take away and I know that Indrajit and I are really looking forward to reading this piece that you you know that I thought it was very clear and nicely structured so it'd be really interesting for us to to have that on the website in due course um, Yes, I think, yeah, we'd, it's mostly just thanks in the chat, it seems like. So we may have come to a natural end. Um, I wonder if you could like do a virtual clap for Owen. Oh, I thought that was a brilliant talk. There's the reaction button if that's easier. Thank you very much. Um, it was great. It was and yes, great and it's lovely to see so many friendly faces as well. Thank you everybody for coming. It's been a great turnout tonight and we're very grateful. Thank you very much. Okay. Oh, we, we have got a comment, uh, not a question, but as a play therapist working with children and young people, I think hope is in the next generation. That's a really good point, actually. There's lots of, I guess, everyone's sort of list, everyone's top 10 is going to be different. Um, but yeah, I think the Gen Z give a lot of grounds for hope as a mum of teenagers as well, although they were kind of driving me mad with their noise just as the talk was starting. But mostly they're quite hopeful. Thank you very much. Lovely to see everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.